So our final speaker this evening um, is Peter Sorger. He'll compare aerospace to pharmaceuticals, exploring the question of what drug developers can learn from companies such as Boeing. Peter is the director of the Harvard Program on Therapeutic Science and professor of HMS's Department of Systems Biology. He co-founded one of the first systems biology programs in the nation, as well as a publicly traded biopharmaceutical company and a private image informatics company. Thank you so much, Peter. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be the closer, I suppose, this evening. Um, You know, I, I spent many years of my career, actually, uh, the first two-thirds of my career at MIT, and as you sort of walk from the Department of Aerospace and Astronautics down to the Department of Biology, uh, you're sort of tempted to ask uh, this sort of curious question that I'm ending the evening with, and that is, what, what actually can we learn from a well-developed and mature engineering discipline like aerospace that might be relevant to thinking about uh, the development of new therapeutic drugs. Both of these industries, of course, develop very complicated sorts of technologies in a highly regulated environment that are dependent on basic science. And I'm going to sort of make two assertions here. The first is that what we see in aerospace is a process of a continuous improvement that has as a really critical component understanding why and how things go wrong and then working out how to make it better. In drug discovery, there's an extraordinarily large uh, rate of failure, and uh, the root cause is really little discovered. Also in aerospace, and you've heard some of this earlier in the evening from people like Zach Kohan, you have a fundamental commitment to quantitative measurement and a computational approach to analyzing complex data. Drug discovery, in common with really all of basic biomedicine, still remains a field uh, that largely relies on pictures and anecdotal observation. So as many of you probably know, the process of drug development follows a fairly classical waterfall sort of model. So it starts out with a preclinical phase that tries to define some of the basic biology. That goes on to try to define the protein or gene that's going to be the target of a therapeutic, particularly in the modern era, and then become uh, a series of phased clinical trials, starting with safety and then into efficacy, and then eventually a pivotal trial that tries to ask whether the new therapeutic agent is better than uh, anything available in standard of care, and then uh, increasing there's sort of a so-called phase four where you look in the market uh, for possible concern about safety or additional indication. So there's been an enormous amount of work, and actually I drew, up, drew this picture uh, from the Food and Drug Administration's website. There's a lot of guidance on how to run this process effectively. It's been extensively discovered. But I think uh, what people fail to realize is the extraordinary fraction of all discovery efforts that in fact result in failure. And you see that a little bit in the following slide in which we see a reduction uh, over the, uh, years, even as the research intensity of pharmaceutical development has gone up, you see fewer and fewer new drugs coming into the clinic. And if you were to ask why that happens, this is phase two data, I think the striking thing is that in general they fail because they don't work. As opposed to, for example, the strategic argument would be, in this case, that, they, uh, that there isn't a good market opportunity and safety would be a toxicity concern. Now, of course, failure is not at all uncommon in most complex engineered systems. And in engineering, there's an entire branch of the discipline known as root cause analysis or failure analysis. And that's concerned with looking at those instances in which something has gone wrong and trying to figure out what went wrong and make it better the next time. So all of you will be aware, for example, of Boeing's flagship 787 aircraft having had a significant problem with the lithium batteries on board that they were overheating. That grounded those aircraft, a $10 billion research and development program at that time. And two months later, the root cause had been discovered, the problem had been fixed, and the aircraft were back in the air. If that had been a drug discovery effort, the planes would have been ground up into little pieces. They would have been thrown out behind the factory and we would have moved on to the 797. And one of the consequences of that, a back of the envelope calculation will tell you not that failure happens early on, where almost certainly it's appropriate. You've got to winnow down a lot of initial opportunities to a much smaller one, uh, number of consequential ones. 
but a lot of it happens fairly late in clinical development. And so you can estimate for a modern therapeutic agent, particularly in an area like oncology where this has been calculated quite carefully, 80 percent of the cost of today's new drug is yesterday's failed drug. So what is one of the things that aerospace is able to do that actually helps? Now, there, we'll get at this issue of false analogy in a moment, but first, I think one of the really striking things is that aerospace development, and in fact all of engineering, is dependent on, on the creation of what we call computational artifacts or simulation models. So this is an attempt to take a representation of the natural world measured carefully. These are the F-18s from McDonnell Douglas flying <laughs> over for the World Series. Uh, um, and you will be very glad to know that 75 percent of them will not fail <laughs> in the process of that fail. Um, so we're all familiar. Back in the, in the old days there were blueprints. Now there are pretty pictures on the right. You can buy this aircraft for 275 million. But underlying this actually are an entire series of extremely sophisticated simulation models that allow companies and academics to work closely together to understand the properties of wings and the properties of surfaces, how they work together. And these have as their underpinning a fundamental piece of mathematics. In the case of the turbulent flow I show you here, it's a solution to the Navier-Stokes equation, which I just briefly mentioned. Well, where are we in biology? We're basically stuck with pictures and drawings. Uh, we seem to have lost one of the pictures and drawings. Um, and what these are, these are big sort of circuit diagrams, how everything might connect. The pretty picture that's missing from this would have told you what we will typically get on a website where you can click on it and nicely for a preclinical scientist, you can order the antibodies to that protein. Um, but we t see these not just as intermediate things, things used to explain to our colleagues what it is we're doing, but instead as definitive artifacts. And relative to an earlier talk that really concentrated on this issue of putting things in the bank for future biomedicine, I think what we've increasingly realized, even at the fundamental scientists, way before we actually get to the practical business of building drugs, is that the artifacts we're putting into the library are in fact minimally useful across such a complex domain. So what about learning from Boeing then? First, let me say there's the possibility of a false analogy here. So when I first started working, I was trained as a biochemist, when I first started doing this kind of quantitative biology, our assumption was, particularly at MIT, is that we would wander across to the Department of Chemical Engineering and would just import wholesale from them the methods that we would need. That turned out to be entirely false. And it has, in fact, been necessary to redevelop these quantitative and uh, simulation tools all anew for the purpose of biological science. At the moment, the problems are much less technical than they really are conceptual. So there's a tendency to see this as a problem of buying the biggest computer on the block, and I don't want Jeff to think of what he can get away without buying us the biggest computer, but that is not primarily the problem. It's how do you take this very uncertain business of uh, biological function in human disease and turn it into something that's usefully computable. And the other thing to keep in mind is that there is extraordinary cultural resistance to this change. So when I go to the American Academy uh, um, uh, and, and in, in cancer research, I'll find that I'm among the younger people up on the podium. When I go to the meetings which largely focus on computational biology and simulation, I am truly the old man in the room. And what you realize is that it is much easier to convince people to take a familiar approach and apply it to a supposedly new problem, the next drug, the next disease, the next indication, then to go back and take all these problems that we've heard about this evening and actually tackle them with a new approach. The second thing to keep in mind is that, in fact, biology is an enormously more uncertain business than astronautics and that building a drug is enormously more uncertain than building an airplane. And I am told in this example uh, of a reasoning process that you could not get to Napoli and Salerno by going on either of these possible roads. <laughs> but I put this up to make the point, it is often assumed in biomedicine at the moment that you are going to try to make something more quantitative, you're going to try to be more precise, you're going to try to get it into this digital format when basically the problem's done and you have a little polish to put on the outside. And we're actually arguing the converse, that this is really at the fundament of knowledge creation and has to be right there at the inception. So it turns out there's actually been a field that has developed in a fairly small way, and it's now growing, over the last 10 years or so, uh, known as systems biology. 
and its primary interest is in combining experimental measurement with quantitative modeling, bringing biomedical science into the same sort of approach to quantitative reasoning that you see in all other natural sciences. It doesn't happen in distinction with experiments, but in fact closely coupled to it. And we've, in the last couple of years, realized that there are things emerging from this discipline that could be directly useful in pharmacology. And I'll leave you with the final thought that, in fact, we now need to invest in thinking a little bit more, leaving aside the issue of false analogy, what it is we might learn from a mature discipline like aerospace and apply to drug discovery. I think it would be wrong for you to come away thinking that this is a problem that lies in industry because ultimately this is a problem that lies with the academy as well. These are concepts that are largely underdeveloped and it is our mission to actually develop those concepts to the point where in fact they're ready for commercialization. And within the last year, we've actually started a new program in therapeutic science at the medical school, which, uh, whose website you can look at here, uh, and it has a number of components within it, but the fundamental concept is to start all the way with that curiosity-driven research we heard about earlier and begin to think also about how we can do a better job of first therapeutic testing in man, how we can test those therapeutic hypotheses, and then working with agencies like the European Medicines Agency and the FDA, rethink the whole process by which we evaluate drugs and move them through phase clinical trials. And you can get one final take on this if any of you are interested from this little paper up here on if we designed airplanes like we designed drugs, which will leave you again with the sense we would take off having gotten ourselves settled in our flight and land at the end of the runway 75% of the time. And I think if we can make that a lot less frequent, a lot less frequent in drug discovery, we're not just going to address unmet medical need, but I think absolutely fundamentally for our society, we're going to do it at a much lower cost, at a cost ultimately that we can all afford. Thank you. Well, thank you, thank you for being our closer. Um, I had a question that it really is stimulated by the fact that you've suggested that we're making some headway around drug discovery. Um, do you see that some of these mechani uh, mechanisms might be applicable in later stage development as well as in, uh, let's say, refreshing our regulatory pathways? Yeah, so it's, you know, it's, uh, you know my, my background is as a basic research scientist, so you know, I naturally see the application to the laboratory. And we were really challenged both by Jeff and by external advisors. Here I have to call out Joshua Boger, mm -hmm. the founder of Vertex to actually think much, much later, later in, the, in the discovery and development process. And really through his uh, enthusiasm for this, one of the most active programs in the therapeutics program is actually a, a re-engagement in regulatory science. So we think actually there is an opportunity to develop much better quantitative tools for thinking about clinical trials. I think the things you heard from Zach would be directly relevant mm -hmm. to that as well, so the better analysis of electronic medical records. And you know, the ultimate, goal would be to get to a process where you've basically tested whether the therapeutic hypothesis is correct or not at perhaps a tenth the cost that we have today. And you know, I think that, that uh, would allow us to identify those things which are not going to work uh, much less expensively. Thank you so much. Well, let me say thank you for stimulating thank you very us. Much.